Hello, and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host Rocco and with me today, our special guest is Emma Marshall. Hi. How are you, Emma? I'm, good. I'm doing good, how are you? Awesome. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk about Linux. We're going to talk about you. What could be better? Yeah, totally. And right, I got so mine. So. There you go. Um, this is the first episode that I don't have coffee with me. So I'm going to try to get through it anyway. So there okay. you go. I'll try not to bore you too much. <laughs> <laughs> So everybody watching is going to know you for your work at System76. And everybody uh, loved the episodes of Destination Linux that you were on and the brunch with Brent. Um, but if somebody didn't know you and they walked up to you and said, who is Emma Marshall personally, what would you say? Um. I'm just like a big, happy pink ball of energy. I do all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I try to do new things every weekend. Um, I have a ton of hobbies. Uh, I love to party plan and I love to go to parties. Um, that's one of my main things is just being social with everyone that I care about and making new friends. Um, I also love hiking, hanging at the lake, uh, board games, arcade games. I'm like a huge pinball fan. Um, I actually go to the arcade. I know I go every Tuesday, but I try to go on Saturday or Sunday too, because that's just how I like to enjoy my weekend. Um, and I really love Law and Order, SVU, and Taylor Swift. So. <laughs> that is a superb list. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty weird mix, but I don't know. But I do, uh, pink is something that really defines me, I think. Uh, I think it really brings out my personality and it, it makes me smile every time I see it. Um, my house is pink. You'll see the, the wall behind me. Um, I'm just surrounded. I surround myself in it and it keeps me happy. There you go. Uh, well, anybody that follows you on Twitter or anywhere else knows that you love pink. So yeah, mm -hmm. that won't come as a surprise to people. <laughs> yeah. This is like my wardrobe every day. My system 76 shirt. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, my yeah. wardrobe is usually black, something black, anything. That works. So you work for System76, obviously, um, but it seems to be far from the typical company uh, that, that most people are accustomed to working for. It seems um, a company where, you know, it brings an atmosphere that doesn't want people to be uptight, on edge. It seems like they... Uh, put out the atmosphere of, you know, hey, we want to work, but we want to have fun at work. So what does a typical day look like at System76 for you? Um, so I, I come in and I announce happy whatever day it is because um, I come in the factory door. So anyone that's sitting there usually says it back and, and smiles. And then I go over to my team and say, what's up, nerds? That's like my, <laughs> <laughs> that's my 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 little um mo so then i just check in with everybody make sure everyone's in a good mood everything um that was escalated the day before has a path to solution um i'll go in and check stock updates for components uh production delays and message customers about it um, then i do lunch with someone on my team and in the afternoon, I like to check in with sales and marketing and see if there's any projects I can help with. Um, and I manage customer service, um, the tickets, the, um, the people that do the tickets. I have three, four people on my team, Jacob, Nathaniel, Thomas, and Aaron. Um, 
So we pretty much just banter all day long in between tickets and make sure they stay productive and happy. And I also track survey responses and basically just listen to all the the community feedback that we get. Um, I do I do read surveys every day and I monitor our social channels. Um, I'm not I don't actively respond to our social networks or posts. Um, I only um, I go into our system and I'll deal with it directly with the customer. But um, I do listen. So I'm listening everywhere. So I hope people people know that when they do say stuff that we hear you. Um, and then I send out a monthly happiness report, which is basically a compilation of feedback, negative and positive of of things, you know, areas of improvement. Everyone in the company gets to see that. So we all have transparency in, in what things need improvement and see if anyone can offer suggestions and help. Um, I sit in on lots of meetings and I'm basically like a feedback processor. Um, <laughs> so, and then um, we have daily Nerf Wars as well. Daily uh, gives Nerf us, Wars. Yeah. It gives us a little boost for the last part of the day. Um, I always get hit and like Ian sits behind me. So I never see it coming, even though I know I should see it by now, but he always gets me in the back and who shoots somebody in the back, Ian, but just, um, that's like the last, <laughs> the last part of the day that isn't like tickets and stuff. Well, I think everything that you mentioned in there that you do is listening, like that skill is needed for everything that you do. And that that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I've been doing it for, um, eight years. So I feel like I have a good idea of, of how to listen and, and what our customers need and want. So I think, um, it's something that I need to have as a skill anyway. Right. Yep. I'd be disappointed if I did this for eight years and didn't have any skills like that. <laughs> Well, I mentioned that you were on uh, other shows, and one of the things I want to bring up is you were on Brunch with Brent, and you mentioned that you love pinball, and you also mentioned it in one of your things that you love. So, you know, you have a lot. You mentioned a lot of hobbies, a lot of things you like. Is pinball up there at the top of the list? Um. Yeah. I guess just going to arcades. It's like my happy place. I, I love the classic games and I love, love the noises, the colors, you know, the people that go there are just really down to earth. Um, it's just a fun way to forget about everything else and just be yourself and not worry about what anyone's thinking, you know, right. and it's healthy competition. I think it's not like too intense, but it's intense enough to like keep me and keep my con competitive nature um, fulfilled. So that's, that's about as much competition as I get in my life. So a yep. little bit of competition, a little bit of unwinding. Yeah. And I also do um, party planning. So I plan, I plan three big uh, events personally every year. And then I do two major events at system 76, which is our, our release parties in April and October. Um, so those, the planning takes up quite a bit of time for those, but the, the main parties I do are, um, I do a pretty crazy Halloween blast. Uh, I do a summer luau and a murder mystery party. So, and they're all at different parts of the year. So we got the whole, the whole year covered of party planning going on. So kept me busy and it's really fun. I'm just having something always to look forward to. Very nice. Yeah. So before we get into like, Linux and everything. We need to start back at the beginning of where you started in computers. So what is the first computer that you remember seeing or touching? Um, okay. So I remember in second grade, the computer was like, I want to say it was like that gross yellow tint of a color. I don't, unless it was supposed to be white and it was just yellow over time. I don't know. Um, with the really clicky keys. Uh, I think it was a Mac because Apple was like, I feel like Apple really got into the schools quickly. So that's why I feel that way. Cause I was in a computer lab and they let us type our stories that we wrote on paper. 
And I was really into writing even in second grade. And so um, I would write stories about kittens and puppies and they'd always be named like Sassy and Chance. And <laughs> like, I just, I just remember those names and it was always puppies and kittens. And, um, and then I, I would type those stories and then my teacher would print them out and laminate them and bind them. And I would give them to my grandpa. So it was like this full thing where I could use the computer and then print it out and see it in real life and touch it, you know? So yeah. I think that was kind of a, a cool experience. Um, and then there was Oregon trail in the classroom in fourth grade. So, yeah. Yep. So these, these books that you uh, printed out, were they saved at all? Do you know, or I, I I don't know. It would be so cool to go back to them now and, and see them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that just made me really excited to call my mom after this. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't know exactly where all that stuff is that, that we put away from him. So, you know, that's your first memory of a computer. Uh, do you remember, you know, when you first got a computer for yourself? Um, yeah, I got a MacBook Pro in when I was 18. Um, and I loved it. I was really in iTunes. I thought that was a really cool um, feature of the computer. I didn't realize that you could um, have such a large music library and have it sound so good on a laptop. Um, they have really good speakers. But that got stolen and I got a Toshiba a Toshiba laptop. I don't know if they make laptops anymore. Um, <laughs> but but uh, that thing lasted like seven years and had windows on it. And I mean, it worked So It just wasn't like, I wasn't into computers. Like I didn't think a mouse pad or keyboard was sexy at that time. So, right. you know, I don't really remember specs or anything. It's okay. Um, hey, I was asked uh, some of my Linux history. And you know what? I'm sitting there thinking to myself, when did this happen? You know, I don't remember half the stuff either. So. Yeah. Well, I remember my, all my system 76 computers. I know every single one that I've had and it's been a lot, but um, yeah, that's because I started loving computers when I started there. Right. Well, yeah, I think anybody would. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. when, when is the first time that you hear about Linux? Um, it was actually, it was open source first. Um, when I was researching system 76 after I was looking for a job. Um, and then I, from system 76, I discovered Ubuntu and then from Ubuntu, I discovered, um, Linux basically. It just all came together system 76, Ubuntu and open source. And, um, it was basically when I was looking for the job at System76 that um, that term started getting thrown around. So the job I was at before, WordPress was an open source platform um, that had ways for the community to develop and, and get involved and chat with each other and improve the product. That was all the open source experience that I had. Um, but then I went to System76, so that's where it all came together. Um, but I can't remember, can't remember the first time I actually heard the word Linux, but, um, I 90% sure that it was Ian or Carl that said it first. Um, and then Linux action show was a podcast or was a video cast from, I want to say like it from eight years ago. Um, and they yep. threw the term around, like it was the most exciting toy in the world. You know, it was like Chris Fisher, Matt Hartley and Brian Lunduke. And it was Linux this and Linux that. And I was like, this is fun. They're really getting into this Linux stuff. So I realized like there, there is a fun entertainment feature to this Linux stuff too. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, they're the first people that made me really get excited about Linux. Well, I just interviewed uh, Chris Fisher, uh, the previous show, and I was talking to him about the Linux action show. And I think there are so many people out there that have, were brought into Linux because of the Linux action show and because of the way it was, uh, because of so the, the fun that they had on that show, it got you excited about it. So 
Yeah, I could totally yeah, agree. I loved the format. I loved that it was like one of the very few at the time, you know, and content creation wasn't super popular, but, and they made it look really good. <laughs> well, now you hear about Linux from Ian and Carl, and, you know, you're hearing it from the Linux Action Show. What is it that maybe uh, intrigued you to try it out for yourself? Um, it was new and, and free and had this awesome community behind it with all these smiling people. Um, the first, the first thing I saw on system 76 website was a big picture. And I don't know if you knew the Ubuntu developer summits, they used to always take a big group photo at the end, um, of all the participants. And he had one of those on the site, um, on the page that explains Ubuntu. That's kind of something that really reeled me in and, and made me want to stick with it. Very nice. So, you know, you, you try this, but is there any fear of trying it or not fear, uh, you know, any reservations, anything that made you say, well, maybe I don't want to lose this or I don't, were you suspect about it? Um, no, I was, I approached it like any other job. Um, you know, anytime you go to a company that you're going to be working on a computer, you likely have to deal with their software. Um, the last places that I worked, that's what I experienced. So I kind of approached the operating system like that and just kind of, you know, I just treated it as a new program that I was learning. Um, but it was different than the other programs. You know, I didn't need somebody sitting over my shoulder telling me where to click and what to do. It was just what do you think you should do? You know, this intuitive interface, um, you know, that's how, and that's how I learned it. It was Ian. Um, I would ask him if I, if he could help me with something and he would never help, you know, he would just be like, <laughs> I mean, he eventually would help if I really needed it, but if he knew that I could figure it out, um, if he was confident that this, the operating system would show me the way, um, he would be like, well, what do you think you should do? And, Sometimes it was super annoying, but most of the time it was fun because it gave me, it made me feel empowered to, to learn and to use an operating system and software that I'd never tried before. So he did help you just in a different way. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So what, what was the first issue you tried? Um, it was Ubuntu 11. 10. Yeah. It was either 1104 or 1110. Oniric. When you're at cost a lot. Yeah. It was a good one. That was when um had the heads up display um for the HUD. That's what it was. That was yep. when Ubuntu really started looking pretty. Yep. So what would you say were the pros and cons of that? Like when you first tried it and you sat down, you know, maybe something worked and there or maybe something didn't, or what was the pros and cons of that first experience from somebody that hadn't run Linux before? Um, the pros were just about everything. I just, I couldn't understand how it had been hiding all this time. Um, I felt like I was in on some big secret <laughs> and just <laughs> didn't understand how this company could be making money off of free software. Uh, so the cons, they're really, I couldn't really think of any beyond not knowing how to do stuff. Um, I really, I had no other use at the time for any other software. Um, the only thing that would, would have been a concern was uh, Word documents, because just trading documents back and forth with customers that had to do purchase orders and stuff. Right. I felt like that was um, not going to work, but it somehow just worked in LibreOffice and there was no compatibility issues. And I really never had a need to go back to Windows or Mac. Wow. So I, I honestly, I am very spoiled and had, I don't think any negative, real negative experiences with it. Well, geez, that answers one of my questions. Cause I usually ask people to, you know, did you stay with it right away or did you go back to Windows or Mac? So that, that is awesome because I think that is the first person that I've sent that. Yeah, I've never felt the need, never wanted to. If I, I think someone's always been able to help me find a solution, you know, and I don't, I don't do like crazy video editing or audio production or anything where it requires tools that, that might not be developed enough for Linux. But um, I mean, the software just works. 
So, um, Jason Evangelo did an interview with Carl Rochelle about System 76. And in this, he mentions the fact that um, nobody at System 76 is forced to use a certain operating system. Like you would think maybe, oh, well, people are forced to use Pop! OS, but that's not the case. Um, so what is your go-to desktop distro on your computers that you use? I'm always on the most up-to-date Pop! version with the GNOME DE. Um, I customized my login logout screen to be bright pink because I can't handle the, you know, when you when you log out, it's like brown and log in, it's brown. It's like, I don't want to be greeted with that. So I just have a, a custom uh, file for that. Nice. But yeah, just keep it simple. Nothing too crazy. No, no window managers flying around the screen. And I don't know. <laughs> well, I am still. Pony icons. <laughs> Right. I'm still running Pop! OS since I think April. So I agree. That's awesome. I thought I saw it in your in the background when you were doing a, a show with Martin. Martin Winkers, yes. I think well, I saw there, the Unleash Your Potential in the background. There is a laptop back there with it on it. Um, that's basically just a if I need to go somewhere laptop. But the, the main machine still runs Pop! OS too. So that's cool. So. Um, how did you start working at System76? Um, I was looking for a job um, for customer service or administrative duties or um, social media. I was really into social media at the time because at the previous company I was working at, I was working on the, um, the intranet, which was powered by WordPress. And we did a lot of videos and a lot of fun social stuff internally. Um, so it was like a perfect mix of everything I knew how to do. So job posting, it almost felt like fixed. I don't even, because <laughs> it was like a customer service and social media with a touch of marketing and some desk duties, you know, some office tasks. It was tailored so, for you. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> so I feel like it was meant to be, seriously. Um, so, and I knew right away when I met Carl, I was like, man, this is, this is a really weird office, but <laughs> this guy, I could like feel his energy when you walk in the door, when he's in his office, like he glows. You got to do a, got to do a spotlight on him soon. I um, would love to. Yeah. But I, after I interviewed with him, he called me shortly after the interview and said I was hired. So, and I walked out like thinking, I, I really want to work here. And he called me pretty quick after the interview. Hey, so. that is awesome to be able to work at a place that you love to work for, because uh, not mm -hmm. everybody's blessed with that. So that is yeah. definitely a great thing. Yeah, it was really small at the time, too. There were only four other people. So uh, it's been a really awesome journey watching it grow to 40 now. I think it's almost it's 36, I guess. In oh, my. That's how I I know our employee count by our general Black count. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the official happiness manager for System 76. So what are your responsibilities there? Uh, so I manage the customer service and tech support team and our ticket queue. Um, basically listen to all customer feedback and compile it for each team in a readable way that can help them actually do something about it. Um, I handle a lot of escalated issues and all sorts of administrative stuff. I also jump into sales and marketing whenever I get a free second to see what I can do. Um, I love to give tours of the factory. I'd love to, to learn all the facts about all the machines and then share that with people and see the excitement on their face. Um, so I've, I've arranged quite a few tours. Um, and I also, like I mentioned earlier, arrange our, our release parties and just um, like internal celebrations for employee birthdays and work anniversaries. And yeah. Seems like you Basically, are... I do what I want to do. Yes, but it seems like you do everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. It's very, it's surprising how many moving parts there are, but I am just a very tiny part of that. 
Well, I'm sure it doesn't, you know, it, it takes more than one person to make a company. So, yeah. So, um, what is your favorite part about working at system 76? Our people and our customers. I just, I love how close we all are as a team. I love how much we laugh. I love how we are all super smart and serious and professional when we need to be and incredibly nerdy and immature when we don't have to, like when we can be. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty much the perfect atmosphere for me because I'm a little weird. Um, <laughs> and I think that I just need to be around my weirdos all the time and their common interests and laugh all day. The only place I think you could just, you could literally laugh all day long while doing some really serious, important work. Yep. I think we're all a little bit weird though. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you said you handle customer service calls. Um, I'm sure you get some very nice calls, some very rewarding calls from customers who love system 76 and love the product. Um, and I'm sure you get others as well. So maybe without going into like, obviously individual customer experiences or naming names, is there like a, uh, a wall of highlights of <laughs> customer calls that uh, may be best and worst of all time? Um, well, I have a couple ideas. Like the worst types of calls are the ones where they get emotional and personal. Um, you know, when, when you're the first line of defense, like you're the first responder, um, and it's the, cu the customer just had the issue and they have a deadline and they can't be without it. And it's a hardware failure and it's all your fault. You're such a piece of crap. Your company is trash. You know, <laughs> when they do that, like you can't interrupt them because you, you know that they have to vent because it's going to make them feel better. They need to get it off their chest, but like it, it drains on you if you get too much of that, you know, it's exhausting and defeating. So those, those are the worst types of calls, but the most fun types of calls are, um, just everyday customers that just have, they have funny stuff to say. They have really cool projects to talk about, um, that are understanding of a hardware failure or Linux being a Linux. Um, those are my favorite types of calls. I don't really do many calls anymore, but I do have, I have two, I okay, one of the best and one of the worst, the worst, <laughs> worst was this guy. I can't remember his name. I wouldn't name drop him anyway, but I really wanted to remember. Uh, he had been going back and forth with support all day. Hadn't talked to me. Um, they, I think it was some like crazy update issue where his computer, um, shut down in the middle of updates. And then it was, it was a really bad situation. Right. Um, but, and he wasn't like open to listening to how to fix it. Cause he was just so mad, you know, he was, his emotions were blocking the solution. Right. Um, so it goes, uh, end of the day comes and he's got to pack his laptop up and ships it out, ships it off to us. Right. Uh, he was apparently drunk and called system 76 and left a message on the company voicemail. And everybody can hear the voicemails and they play them on speaker at the time, which was very embarrassing. Um, he had called and left a message saying how hot I was and um, to show me. So, and it was because I, I had messaged him through the ticket, which is it's attached to our avatar. And so I was the first female to interact with him on a ticket. And I think I think that's kind of what spurred him to do that. But um, he apologized the next day, right. which, you know, I guess you can excuse them for, for apologizing, but it's just, it's embarrassing and disgusting and it just doesn't belong in support or Linux or any job anywhere, really. So right. that was, that was one of the worst, you know, I really felt like a woman at that time. <laughs> I hate when I <laughs> feel like that. Um, so, but the cool thing about those is when people act weird like that, they always apologize, which is the human part about it. Um, I mean, it's always something that, you know, their, their day isn't just their laptop, you know, their, right. their family has, you know, there's so many other factors that weigh into it. And I understand that. So 
I don't hold it against anybody and I'm happy to work with them if they didn't cuss me out before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but those calls became like more rare um, as the years went on. So, I mean, the last thing that I remember, the last bad one that I remember was that voicemail. And that was, uh, that was a couple of years ago. Um, there's the occasional statements like, can you, uh, can you ask one of the male technicians this answer before even like <laughs> asking the question? It's like, dude, just ask the freaking question. Why preface it with that? That's just weird. It's adding time to your conversation for one. It's making me feel weird for two and it's unnecessary. So I don't like that either, but the funniest call I got, this is the most memorable call. Um, I couldn't tell if it was real. No one's, no one's owned up to pranking me if it was a prank, but, uh, this woman calls and she demands to, um, get instructions on removing her webcam. And I was like, okay, well, I, I need to get the serial number on the bottom of the machine. Can you please flip it over and read it to me? And she's like, you don't need my serial number. I know you have it. You can see my phone number and my name. And I know, you know, my serial number. And she just went into this crazy paranoia thing. And I was like, okay, you know, some of our customers may have, um, like some paranoia or mental issues. Um, I understand whatever. Um, I'll go with it. So, uh, I kept, I kept going with it and she kept insisting that I knew it. And so she started yelling at me saying, look, I need to talk to your supervisor. I work for the CIA. My code name's dangerous good or damaged good. And she's like, I know all about MK ultra. <laughs> and it was like, it was so, so good <sighs> that it seemed unreal. But now that no one has owned up to it after all this time, I think it was real. And I tweeted, I tweeted that, that, that call on Twitter, um, like as it happened. So the text of the call is on there, um, <laughs> but there's no like identifying information. But the best part about the call is it was an HP laptop by the end of it. Not it was an HP laptop. Uh, <laughs> it oh, was yeah. a good twenty perfect. minutes of my twenty minutes of my life. That's that perfect. I I was just really wanting that serial number because I knew I had a feeling that you know that she wasn't one of our customers because she wouldn't read the serial number, um, and that's that's like the first thing I need. <laughs> right. So that I'll never forget that lady. Well, it takes all kinds to make the world go round. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, System76 offers laptops, desktops, um, and they're all pre-installed with Linux, which is absolutely fantastic. So do you have a favorite one out of the lines of laptops or yeah. desktops? Yeah, the Galago Pro and the Darter Pro. Um, I'm waiting to upgrade to the Darter Pro, um, but it's busy in the lab, but it is mine next. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was mine for like a day. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it was like the Destination Linux episode. I had, um, I had said, I was like, I really like the Galago, but I'm like ready to upgrade to the Darter. So I got the Darter like two days later after that episode aired, which was convenient. Um, but then there was an issue that they needed it for, for testing and firmware stuff. So I had to put my drive in the Galago and now I'm, I'm in an upgraded Galago. So that's cool, but I want the darter now. Yeah. <laughs> Every, anybody listening, she wants the darter now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. totally. Um, I watched, uh, Jay's video from learn Linux TV. Um, he did an unboxing of his Thelio that he got from the Supervane event and yeah. the Galago Pro uh, that he, I guess he was going to be reviewing. And of course, you know, he opens this with a shark tooth. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> I haven't been able to watch all the content yet, but that sounds hysterical and just like Jay. <laughs> yeah, just like him. And I don't, you know, he was having trouble with, you know, it was, it's obviously not like a razor blade or anything, but uh, yeah. So he opens this with a shark tooth. And, you know, the first thing that pops out 
is that you guys do some amazing work with the branding of System76 itself and of the specific lines that you offer. So the Thelio and the Galago Pro, they both have different packaging. They both have, um, like the Thelio came with multiple languages printed on the inside. And the 76 Galago- 76 different languages. 76, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And the Galago Pro also had its own particular branding of packages. And I think that is an important part. Um, you know, some people will say that that's superficial. It's just packaging. But in my opinion, that goes to how much System76 cares about each line that they offer and the products and their brand that they offer. So can you like tell us a little bit about what goes into all of that? Yeah. It's- I mean, it's hours and hours of creative resources being pulled together. Um, Kate Hazen is our creative director. She has been our designer uh, for a really long time. I want to say she's been there for six years. Um, But she really helped define our brand image um, as far as design goes. And she is really in touch with the nerdy side, like all of us. So it really works. But She has a talent of working closely with Carl to bring out his vision um, and take the team's ideas and turn them into a brand that we can all relate to. So I'm amazed by her work every day. Um, I am like a total fangirl. I think she should be, you know, be uh, awarded somehow, but I don't know if there's any open source design contest, but. (laughs) Well, um, I love the, the artwork that has been there from the beginning. Um, so I am a big fan of Kate myself. Yeah. And then there's some, there's some other fun things like on the actual products, the, the Thaleo has a solar system fan intake and outtake. Um, it's laser etched into the position of the solar system at the Unix epoch. And then the outtake fan is the system 76 start date. So uh, that's it's pretty nerdy and then some little things like easter eggs are something our customers seem to be fond of so planted some of those like um there's klingon in the the thaleo packaging in one of those languages um there's also some morse code on the actual thaleo machine um there's just really? so many there's a lot of little things that they they really thought of and i i was super amazed every time i heard these fun ideas you know I'm just like, gosh, that is so cool. And I always yes. high five Carl because he never, never ceases to amaze me with his fun ideas. Well, so. you know, you had mentioned earlier, uh, or I had mentioned earlier about you being there. And, you know, you had said you're one of many different people that work there that are awesome people. Um, and that it takes many people to make up a company like system 76 and the vision that it has. So from my perspective, there seems to be that great atmosphere at system 76, where every single person counts. Every single person is appreciated. That's the, that's me looking at it from the outside in. So stepping back from that and seeing it from the community side, are there any, you know, you know, you had mentioned Kate, are there any unsung heroes that don't get enough credit for what they do that you want to mention? Yeah. Um, our operations director, my, my manager, who it's Bjorn. Um, he did, I don't, people will know him because he did, uh, some parts in the super fan videos, He's like wearing a lab coat. Uh, but he, he is such a good manager and director and organizer and leader. And he's just, I've never had a boss like him, you know, he really encouraged us all to be human and he's the most human out of any company I've ever been at. He, he really doesn't feel like a boss. He feels like a human, which is, is different. Um, another one is, uh, our QA team, Ben Spurk. <laughs> he's in Mattermost. Um, I don't think he's on other Twitter, like Twitter. Well, he's sometimes on Twitter, but he mostly hangs out on Mattermost. He's our QA manager. That dude is just a machine. I mean, he works, I feel like he works the longest hours. Um, I mean, he's, he's there in the morning after people leave. Um, he's always finding things that are wrong, but getting them fixed, you know, quickly. 
um, the factory ladies. We have uh, Sarah, Victoria, Juby, May, uh, Stephanie. Uh, all of those girls are just, they work physically harder than all of us every day. And they're a bunch of chicks. And I love it. It's, they're complete badasses. Um, my whole team, Nathaniel, Thomas, Jacob, Aaron, they're so nerdy and fun and just so perfect with customers. They are, they are our customer. So it is good for them to be in the position they are in. That's awesome. So I could name everybody. I want to name everybody because it's... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Name everybody if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> one more. One more. Go ahead. Uh, uh, two more. Uh, Jeremy, he's our lead engineer. Um, he is a genius. Uh, he's got some talks out, like an open source uh, firmware talk that just came out, and you'll see just how insanely smart he is. Um, and Michael Aaron Murphy is the lead maintainer for POP. And he's super quiet, but he should get so much credit. It's crazy. Um, like we barely speak to each other, but I watch all the stuff he does online and he's a very great communicator online. Um, but he is just very smart and quick and productive. So the whole team is just so amazing. <laughs> yep. Sounds like an amazing place. Yeah. So you have this small, this small event called system 76 super van event and i mean yeah. i mean that sarcastically um tell us how this whole event got started it used to be small <laughs> started out as like a it was like a fan appreciation thing um where we were just gonna to you know say thanks to some of our biggest fans and it was a contest on social media where they basically just try to show us what they do with open source or our machines and and why they're a fan of system 76 and uh, that we flew them out and we flew out some, some media people that, that were at the time. It was like Chris and Noah and Brian Lunduke. Um, so that was, that was pretty fun. Um, but it started off really small, just like a little community event like that. And then it just kind of has developed into this huge production um, because we have a factory. So there's, you know, there's more room, more options, more events to do, but um it turned into a, a thing where you have a mission, a theme, um, and then you just go through all the stations of your mission. Uh, that uh, like there was the first one was uh, like a LARPing type of theme. It was like uh, okay, like medieval times, right. uh, legends of the lake. <laughs> but then there was, <laughs> and then there was one that was just like a super fan appreciation. And that was. That one just had a, a fun technical theme. Um, but it's just a way to get back to the community and, and get them involved because I think one of the most valuable things is the roundtable discussion, which I think it was like three hours this time. Um, so basically everyone gets a chance to talk and give their input on what they want to see from us. Um, we show them sneak peeks at what we're working on. Um, the the super fan, the previous super fan actually got to see the prototype paleo machine um, and give feedback. So I, I think it's hysterical, like looking at that prototype and knowing that we showed it to them and, and having, the, having the final product and how, I mean, it was pretty, it was, it was decently close, but there's some stuff that I just really laugh about. Like the, the, the idea of having something spacey on there it was um, originally like a constellation and it was like dots and stuff. And I was like, kind of like a polka dot computer at first. So <laughs> I was like, no, but nobody got it. No one understood it. So I think that super fan was, was super valuable because, you know, <laughs> we, we might've gone with it if they didn't say something. Polka dot computers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it just feels, feels like, what we should do as a company is instead of spending our marketing dollars on flashy commercials and celebrity endorsements, we could spend it on making sure that people that, that fuel our brand are taken care of and get treated like the nerdy royalty that they deserve. Um, and <laughs> let them have a voice in what we do as a company because we're doing it for them and it matters. Well, I think that is one of the big differences that you can actually feel like coming, looking at it from the outside is that, you know, 
it does appear that you guys listen to feedback that you, and that's rare for a company. You know, most companies, you know, you think of, you could say whatever you wanted and they would probably never even answer you, let alone listen to your feedback and maybe sometimes act on it. So that is mm -hmm. awesome. Well, I watched the videos uh, from the first uh, super fan event and then the second and then the third one this year. Uh, and it looks, it looks like it was an amazing time this year. Everybody that, you know, had put out videos on this afterwards, you know, talked about how great a time they had. Do you have a favorite memory from this year's super fan event? Um, yeah, the, the reveal at the end when, um, they open the powder coating room door is like a big yellow garage door. Um, and they had a fog machine and the lights were all cool. And Carl was standing there in a bright green. He was an intergalactic trader along the mission for the super fans. So he was the last step. Um, but he walked out of there in that outfit. And then Aaron <laughs> was wearing the tux suit and it come out in the fog. And it was just like, Oh my God, like this, this is, such a cool moment and nobody else would understand this except us. Um, but then Carl said that they would all get to take home that stack of failures that we made for them. And um, their faces were like, it, it was just like cool. I mean, it was like kids at Christmas basically. Yep. So I, I really liked that. Um, oh, the Nerf war at the very end was pretty fun. Uh, we turned after we turned on all the lights and it wasn't as dangerous. We uh, ran around the factory and, you know, we have a bunch of foam packaging in the middle of the factory. So, you know, with the way everything's set up, it's like you have your bases and your barriers and it is perfect for a nerf war. Like, did you get perfect. shot in the back? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> I got shot in the ear and my ear was ringing for a good five minutes. It was awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, like I said, it sounds like everybody had a great time. And I think it's awesome that uh, System 76 puts out an event like that. So. Yeah. And I, I think if anyone's listening and, and they want to be part of that event, you don't have to wait a year to get started on your submission. I think starting as soon as possible um, to get a submission into us to come out, uh, you can work really hard on it and make it really cool. Um, because some people really went to town on it. Like one guy designed a, a whole uh, server, a uh, cloud portable server. And that was, that was really awesome for just for super fan, um, just to be able to come out. So people can get their contest entries ready for the next year if they want, and then just submit them when it happens. That's what I suggest. Start now. <laughs> yep. Don't be surprised about it. So what is your daily workflow like? Um, like what software do you rely on most in your daily job? So I usually just use um, a Slack, a web browser, um, a terminal, text editor. So just like basic stuff like Gedit. Uh, Flameshot is probably the, like the coolest app that I could recommend that people use for any type of workflow that involves screenshots. Should um, I be embarrassed that I don't know what Flameshot is? No, I, <laughs> I, it's so good that I don't want to tell people about it sometimes <laughs> because I'm like, no, this is my tool. If some people, if people get this tool, like there's going to be just way too much content on the internet. Um, but it just makes it too easy to make images for people that have no artistic skills. Um, so it sounds it just, very familiar, but yet I don't, I just can't place of what is particular about flame shot. Uh, so, so it has all the editing features built into the screenshot tool. So, um, for training manuals, I, I write our, the customer happiness manual is our training manual that all my, my team has to follow all the processes in. So, Anytime a process changes, I, I go through the process in our CMS system, screenshot it, and then you can add little um, like red boxes and arrows and text. And it just makes manuals and documentation super easy. So it's, it's, um, I'm gonna have to check it out. It's crazy that it's free. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anything else? Um, no. Okay. I like GIMP. I like Inkscape. I like VLC. Um, I don't use all that stuff too often because I'm not into creating as much content anymore. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't get too crazy with things. All right. So, you know, talking about software, is there any software that's not available on Linux right now that you'd say, man, that would be awesome if it came to Linux? Yeah, I really wish we could get people away from Adobe somehow. Uh, it's just, I really feel like that market is hard to pull away, uh, depending on how deep their skill level is with that software. I don't think there's anything quite comparable in Linux yet. I mean, in Inkscape and GIMP are nice, but you know, you can't just go to those tools when you've been learning this software your entire career, you know? Um, so I wish there was an easy way to get people to transition away from that um, or just to prevent people from using it in general. Because it's just something that Linux can't. I mean, if we could focus on getting someone to, to develop those programs like that, that would be cool. But I think it, it kind of failed with uh, Akira, I think was a project that was a Kickstarter. And uh, I thought that project had great potential and still does. It still does. Yeah. It I just think, may um, take a while. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's going to take a while, but, you know, I hope, I hope that that's where they're headed. And I think that's where he's headed to, um, just to give that tool to people that need to get away from Adobe. Well, you know, you mentioned the Nerf Wars and you mentioned uh, all kinds of things that System76 does. So have you guys ever walked into, you know, the local computer store, maybe Best Buy? and uh distracted the employees long enough to install linux on them no but it has been brought up and it is funny um i i actually was joking about it with ian one time when a new mac store opened when i first started there and he was uh we were both joking about how we should go to the mac store and and try to put a bento on all the screens <laughs> and carl overheard us and i'll never forget this because this phrase stuck with me he goes I was like, Carl, would, would that be okay if we did that? And he was like, you know, guys, this is how I want you to think about things. Before you make a decision on what you're going to do in the name of System 76, ask yourself, is this classy? And then he just like walked off. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it, was, it was so perfect. It stuck mm. with me and I, it has helped guide like every decision I've made where I've questioned, can I do this or should I do this or not? I'm always like, is this classy? <laughs> <laughs> that's something to remember. That's, that's some good advice. Yeah. All right. I guess installing computers at Best Buy is out. Sorry. Yeah. No <laughs> Linux. Well, let's talk about uh, Linux conferences for a little while. So you missed going to self this year because of real life issues. Um, and I was hoping to get to meet you down there, but how many Linux conferences have you been to? I really can't count. And I, I stopped saving my lanyards because that was a thing. And I, I had to donate t-shirts. I've gone to enough to have to donate the t-shirts to the thrift store. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> so, so do you yeah, have a favorite? Yeah, Linux Fest Northwest is my all-time favorite. Um, I love the Linux Fest, you know, Self, Linux Fest Northwest, and Scale. Those are the three ones I'll be going to in this upcoming year. Um, but I just, those are the most community-oriented and, and chill and laid-back, fun, um, honest conferences that, I, that don't feel corporate to me, and I, I like that atmosphere a lot. Yeah, Self was a great time. Um do you find any like differences between the three conferences or is there something that is that whole, are they similar and that's why they appeal to you? Um, well, yeah, the similar thing is like, they're all, it's like a family reunion every time. Um, but there are differences. Um, self, I haven't been to in a really long time. So I remember that being the smallest of all of them, but from what I've heard, it's, it's gotten a lot bigger. Um, scale is is just a lot of people it can be overwhelming at times um, and it's just a different kind of fest 
you know, it has a little bit of a corporate vibe on top of the community vibe. Um, but Linux Fest Northwest is is straight community. You know, there is there feels like nothing corporate going on there, and it's just all about family and fun and friends, and you know, it's just yep. a it's a great way to get with everybody. Also from uh, Jupiter Broadcasting, um, so it's one of the few that all of them go to. So right. I really like to go to that one. Someday I'm gonna get there. Someday. <laughs> you should make it a point. I'm going to try. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, wa- I try to watch the, the talks that come out from all of the conferences and the talks itself were outstanding. So you have given presentations at conferences and I've seen a couple of yours. So do you enjoy that part of it the most or is there more, is there other things in the events that you uh, enjoy better? Um, well, they're very, talks are a very small part of conferences for me. I mean, they're pretty time consuming to prepare and practice. Um, but once I get there, it's like, you know, maybe an hour to hype myself up and then an hour in the talk and then it's back to the booth or, um, back to whatever event I'm helping with that night. Um, but the, the main thing is I'm like on a mission to create lasting memories and connections when I go to these fests, not like there to present things. That's a plus. And I think that that helps me get a, a yes, you could go. Um, so, um, but I love being at the booth and talking to as many people as I can. And the after parties are, are like the biggest motivator as well, because I just, I think, Nerds like to play all the games I like to play, like card games and board games and classic arcade stuff. So it's like I don't have a lot of that here except my System 76 family. Right. So it's really cool to be in um, in a room with that many people that have that kind of energy. Well, just talking to the people in the hallway was like my favorite part of being itself. Um, you know, you would walk down and you can talk to the people at the booths, but you can talk to just anybody that's just walking around and they all understand you. They all like the same things that you like. It's, it's an awesome part of the conference. Yeah. So are you a, um, an open source enthusiast to the point where everything you run has to be open source or are you more on the pragmatic side where if you just want to use the best tool for the job, even if that would include proprietary software? Well, I personally will only use open source, but I don't try to force it on other people if they don't want to use it. I don't give anyone the side eye or treat them different. Um, I just use what works and open software just works for me. And for most people that come to me with computer issues that use Windows or something, it ends up just working for them as well. So um, I think it's important not to push it on people. Uh, I used to be pretty pushy about it um, when I was in sales. I just wanted everyone to get Linux on their computer. So I was like all hardcore about getting people to switch to Linux. And now I've come to realize that I just want people to be happy on their computers. And if they can't find that with Linux, they'll have this weird negativity towards it that it's not necessary and it's avoidable. So if they're not ready for it or it's not right for them, then, you know, use the other software that you have to pay for and get spied on with. But, you know, it's their choice. (laughs) Just throwing it out there. Yeah. Um, But, well... The reason I bring it up is because there are people who will like kind of shame you into using open source software. And to me, I, I have not found anything successful about trying to force it on people. And like in the same way you said, um, you can't just force people to use Linux if they don't want to use Linux, you know, uh, it's, it's fruitless to try to force it. Yeah, it's not effective either for the long run. Yep. So I started using Linux because of the freedom it gave you, because of the flexibility, customization, because I was big into customizing back then, and you could only do so much in Windows. Um, 
over the years, I've come to the conclusion that the community is the best thing and the best reason to run Linux. But what drives your passion for Linux? It's absolutely the community and um, Carl's vision is something like I feel a need to, to help him see it through. I think all of us that work at System76 do. Um, it's an important vision. It's an important mission. And, you know, it's doable. You know, we can make hardware open source. We can make, you know, firmware open source. You know, hopefully eventually we can get NVIDIA to open source their graphics That would drivers. be so awesome. Yeah. You know, there, there's got to be a way for us to, to make that happen. And I think if we all just stick with it, we'll get there. Um, but that, you know, that idea of, of accomplishing more and doing it for Carl and the company is, is really what drives me. So for a long time, the community, uh, the Linux community in general, had a bad reputation for, you know, being unfriendly to people, uh, not being welcoming. So you, a new person would come in and they would, you know, ask a question and, you know, you would get all kinds of uh, ignorant comments. Now, there's still some remnants of that around, like, but they're getting fewer and fewer and fewer as the years pass. Um, but can you give us your experience on how you or the people around you have been treated by the community as a whole? Yeah, I mean, it's been a, a good, positive experience for the most part. Um, there's been some ups and downs, just like with, with any company, but you know, I haven't experienced what a lot of women experienced, um, which is like negativity towards my gender, um, which I know is a big challenge for, it's a big challenge for a lot of women, but I don't experience that at System 76 from employees. The only place I ever got that was from the community, either in a tech support ticket or online or on a phone call. So really, I've, I'm luckier than most. Um, but I know that there are some women that that do feel like they're not included as much and they aren't, um, their skill level isn't thought to be as good as men just because they're a woman, which I believe is pretty weird um, and unfounded and wrong. Well, I think you should be viewing people by who they are and not what they are. Yeah. Do you do any uh, coding, scripting of any kind? No, I more like look at the, the code and find out what's not working and how we can fix it. So um, I, I know Bash, I've written a, a happiness script. It's called happiness. It just sends happy quotes to your, <laughs> your desktop. You know. But um, yeah, and then I, I'll just customize my configuration files, but I don't consider any of that coding. I think Bash people could consider coding, but. Yeah, I'm not uh I'm not a coder myself. Yeah. So there's a lot of people around the community that feel like they can't contribute in a meaningful meaningful way to Linux. Um but everybody has different talents and everybody has something to give. Um you are a perfect example of contributing of how you interact with the community. Uh being positive all the time and trying to help people and bring them up during the day. But what would you say to those people who are searching to find some way to contribute to Linux and the community itself? Just start talking to people, you know, find the software you like, join the forums, um, and stay positive. I think an important part is staying positive and not putting down anybody's projects. Um, because if you jump in there and you're like, I hate this, this, and this about the software, can you do this and this? That's not really contributing. It's just like complaining. Um, so I think that that puts things in a, in a weird perspective too, because you could see it as a contribution, but that kind of contribution I think is more harmful. Um, but yeah, if you could just start talking to people, connect, because it's all about the community and and finding ways to work together to build your project out. Yep. Uh, people underestimate the, what they can give to the community, but, it, but everybody has that 
something that they can give to somebody else that will help them. You know, you may not help a thousand people. You may only help this person or that person, but everybody makes up the community and, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody can contribute in some way. So I asked this to most people and I have gotten many, many different answers. Um, So I'll ask you, do you believe Linux is bad at marketing or promoting itself? Um, So the thing about Linux marketing is we are the ones marketing it. So we, the community, so it's all about the tone that we set and the behavior and support for each other that we show online is what really invites people to Linux. So writing blog posts, saying things suck, isn't productive. Um, Our marketing doesn't suck. It's appropriate and targeted to a select audience. To say projects or efforts suck uh, is negative. Um, it's negative marketing. It's a negative tone for Linux. So those kind of articles, I think, are I don't want to say I want to say toxic. They're toxic. Um, that stuff spreads. And you know, if you're going to write an article like that, and it's going to be the first thing that people search for about Linux that day, you just lost however many people searched for Linux that day because of your article. You know, I just. I think there are appropriate channels to provide feedback and effective ways to make change. But I just really don't agree with anyone who says that Linux marketing sucks. And seriously, the people doing the marketing don't suck. And they don't want to be told that they suck because they spend a lot of hours and, you know, sweat, tears, blood, whatever. You know, it's it's not cool to tell them that they suck. You know, we're humans. We would appreciate, you know, good feedback, feedback that we can work with. And, you know, the negative stuff does nothing to change things. And I know, I know what article that you're referring to. And I spoke with him, um, the person that wrote that article and I let him know how I felt about it and, and tried to encourage him to turn that around and let him know that, you know, that's actually negative marketing for Linux. So that actually sucks. So if you could not do that, it'd be great. Um, (laughs) So that tone makes all the difference. And I felt, I felt empowered that I could say that and hopefully that stuck, but we market by building a community, you know, not by some flashy commercials and celebrity endorsements. Well, you're right in the way, in the fact that, uh, it is how you approach it and it is what tone you take in it. Um, I will, I have said in the past that Linux is bad at marketing, Um, Not from a standpoint of a particular project is not doing their marketing well, but just on a whole, uh, we don't, we don't show off Linux as much as say Windows shows off Windows or Mac shows off Mac. Um, And I think we should do that. But I think if, but again, I'll go back to what you said is it's all about how you approach it. And it's all about whether you're approaching it from a, you know, if you're telling somebody, uh, say, uh, this is bad, then you tell it in a constructive way. I'll give you an example. We, we do a distro challenge on Biddle. And you can go on that distro challenge and you can say, hey, this distro is lousy and, it's, and, it's, and it stinks. Or you could go on there and say, this is, these are the good things about it. These are the bad things about it. Um, it's not for me or it is for me. It's great. And it is all about how you approach it. And I think that uh, we could all do a better job at being positive in the community. Yeah, I think um, what people don't realize or remember or keep in the front of their mind is that all of that stuff is searchable online. When you search on a, a browser or a search engine, you're going to get some social, um, some socials, some blog posts you know, some corporate posts, there's a big variety in there. And if it's filled with all that negative, this sucks type of energy, nobody's ever going to want to try Linux. So I think, I think that's a really big step that we could take as a community is just lift each other up and be positive about projects. And, um, I don't think it necessarily means spending a bunch of money on marketing. So if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Um, probably just what we we're talking about, the negativity. I, I hope that people start to understand that 
it's not cool to put down projects when it's open source, when it's free, when this developer is not getting paid for it. Um, it's just, it's, you know, think about the human beyond the software. I think the community could really do a better job at that um, because you could make people quit projects. They get enough people telling them they suck, they'll bow down. And what if that software is what someone needs to change the world? And that is what our customers, the customers that we have are changing the world. I mean, they're doing very important stuff. And I would hate for, for someone to just bow down because of something negative. Yep. And there have been, there have been developers that have stepped aside because of negativity in the community. And, you know, I've talked about it many times that, you know, a simple thank you goes a long way. Uh, a simple email something small, but something to encourage somebody to do something. Cause you're right. These, these, these people do this out of their own free time, out of the love and passion they have for the, for Linux and the Linux community itself. So, uh, we should all be appreciative of what they're doing. Yeah. And I think if people take like 10 seconds to stop before they complain and think about, is this productive? Can this help the software? Is there a way that I can help? You know, I think, I think if someone could just think about those things, it'll help them stay positive. But the more people focus on what they don't like, it's just not going to, not going to grow. So you started using uh, Linux at system 76 and thinking of the reasons that you chose to run Linux, do those reasons still apply today? Now that I think about it, no, because I felt like it wasn't really a choice. Uh, I didn't feel like it was a choice at System76. I mean, it was like the computer that I had. I couldn't like open my laptop and just whip out some windows and start doing System76 work. So at that time, it was, I didn't have a choice. And now I have a choice and I choose to stay. So that's Very nice. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with people? Just Stay positive and lift each other up. You know, if someone is being mean, you can even politely tell them, hey, this isn't productive. But let's just wash all the trolls out, you guys, because we can make Linux the only operating system if we really try. We definitely need to wash out them trolls. Definitely. So how can people get in touch with you, Emma? Um, I am Emma at system76.com or social happiness on Twitter. Very nice. And the cat postings on Twitter are awesome. So you should follow her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I look for kitten stuff every day. So if you need that, you can find it on my feed. All right. Uh, Emma, thank you so much for what you do in, in the community, at your job, the interactions that you have with people. Um, you do an amazing job and I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoy the Linux spotlight every week. All right. That's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community until next time, long live Linux. Man, I wish I could find someone that would want to talk about arcade games. I need to like go to an arcade and, and just video review all the games or something because you should I feel like nobody does that. And I think that that would be an incredible life if I could make something from that. <laughs> you could go around the world hunting uh, classic arcade games. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you about this one pinball machine I just found last weekend. What? Um, it's it's actually at the arcade closest to my house and it's so pac-man is my favorite arcade game of all time um beyond b side pinball so it's a pac-man dual fighting pinball game. what yeah i'll send you a picture i'll post it on twitter because i need to share this with the world yeah but i don't think i have ever had that much fun playing a game like i was i think is it was this the a excitement new one? factor yeah 
yeah, it was brand new and it's huge. So it's like, it's like, like right when you go in, you're like, <laughs> this is what I'm playing right now. And the excitement factor is just crazy. I have an arcade that's right by my house. So it's oh. like a, it's like I could stop there every day. And then Tuesdays, I do that alone on purpose because like me time. Right. Because I like to just like keep practicing and think it gets annoying. And when people are talking to me and distracting me, I don't get all the points. <laughs> <laughs>